Well, thank you so very, very much for being here. Thank you so much for singing together. If you're visiting with us from an area congregation, you're just so welcome here. If you're from the community here in Lindale or uh, the surrounding area, please know that anybody here at the Lindale Church of Christ would love to study with you. We would love to get to know you and help you in any way that we can. Reach out to any of the members here. I, too, am a visitor here at Lindale, and I've been made to feel at home and welcomed by this congregation, and I know that they would treat you in the same way, with the same love and the same care that they've shown to me. This week we've been talking about subjects surrounding masculinity, manliness, maturity, and morality, and how it is that we grow to become the men that God calls us to be. Tonight I want to talk about moral excellence, and I want to begin by reiterating, reiterating some of the lyrics from the song that we just sang. It's number 115 in the supplemental song, if you want to follow along and read again here, the lyrics say, O oh, Father, I do sin, my heart breaks deep within, for you have sought me, yet I turn away from all your loving care. So often do I fall, yet you reach out again, lifting my burden that is more than I can ever bear. Through your beloved Son, there is grace so undeserved. How can I ever sin against the one who makes my heart to sing? Create a heart so clean that like you, I may be as light of morning rises up with healing in its wings. My broken, contrite heart is so worthless in my sight, but you restore it. Give it peace and joy to love and follow you. Oh, may I ever strive to live pure in your sight, filled with your goodness, free to glorify and to honor you. Have your Bibles open to Psalm 51 at this time, because I think some of these lyrics were inspired by the words of Psalm 51. As David is reflecting upon the sin in his own life, he has these things to say in this psalm. And while you're turning there, I want to say this. In a lesson on moral excellence, sometimes it comes across as if we strive for moral excellence because we want to be better than the people around us. That we want to elevate ourselves to this great stature. We want to live up to the command to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, but we do it in all the wrong ways. Through self-aggrandizement, which is just a fancy way of saying putting yourself on a moral pedestal. And yet, In the lyrics to this song and in Psalm 51, the motivation for moral excellence has nothing to do with putting myself on a pit at all. The motivation for moral excellence has nothing to do with some self-derived sense of perfection and righteousness. It is all about, in light of my sin and failure, in light of God's grace and mercy, How could I live in any other way but moral excellence? Take a look at some of these words here in Psalm 51. As David speaks about his sin, he says in verse 7, Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness and let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Where does David give credit when it comes to his holiness, his purity, his spiritual cleanliness. He gives all the credit to God. It is all to God. If you wash me, God, then I'll be clean. If you blot out my iniquities, then I will not have any iniquities anymore. Only you can do that. Verse 10 of Psalm 51, David goes on to write, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from thy presence. Don't take thy Holy Spirit away from me. uh, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. And he goes on to say here that once that has happened, when the moral perfection in God has been achieved, he says, then... I will be able to teach other sinners about you. And I can use my own life as an example to say, I was once just as sinful as you. I was once also lost like you. But look at what God does through me. Look at what God can do with the contrite and humble sinner. 
He can change that sinner into a saint and he can clean and he can wash and he can restore and he can renew and he can make me alive again and he can do that to you as well. That's where I wanted to start this lesson because I don't want anybody to think that preaching about moral excellence is the same thing as encouraging moral superiority. It is not about our moral superiority. And I actually have a few things to say about that here in a few minutes later on in the lesson. Now, this phrase moral excellence, you see it a number of times throughout the Bible. In particular, there's a, there's a great usage of this passage in 2 Peter chapter 1. And if you'd like to follow along, let's read together in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, incidentally, last year, this passage was used as the basis for our yearly spiritual theme at the East Shelby Church of Christ. What we did is we took this passage in 2 Peter chapter 1 and we looked at each of these virtues that are subscribed or prescribed here and we spent some time every month looking at each of the virtues in turn. And he begins here in verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence knowledge, in your knowledge self-control, in your self-control perseverance, in your perseverance godliness, in your godliness brotherly kindness, in your brotherly kindness love. For, verse 8, if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the warning in verses 9 and 10 is, For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten what? His purification from his former sins. When you forget to live by the Christian virtues outlined here, these amazing overlapping interconnected virtues as he explains as love, or, or excuse me, as faith and moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love, if you fail to live by these things, you forgot that God took you, the sinner, and made you into the saint. You forgot all about that. You've forgotten your former purification of sins. Therefore, verse 10, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Ideally, that's the goal, isn't it? That's what we're all working toward is to cultivate these Christian virtues in such a way that they buttress one another, and they're interconnected, that they support one another, and that I can then live the faithful life that God has expected and asked me and commanded me to do. So with tonight's lesson, I want to have an explanation of five thoughts. Wait, five thoughts. That was, that was, I had all my fingers up there. I want to be clear. Five thoughts. I have five thoughts on moral excellence that I want to go through. The five thoughts are the following. Moral excellence begins with accepting God's direction in all things. You have to start with that before you move on to anything else. Accept that God is in control. Let God be the commander of your life and your destiny, first and foremost. Second, it is fostered by setting the right expectations. Third, it'll always feel out of place in a lost world. Fourth, it's easily neutralized by a sense of superiority. And fifth, it is never found hiding in the shadows of this world. So let's go through each of these thoughts on moral excellence together. And I certainly hope this will be an encouraging lesson to you, not just to the men, not to the young men, not to the teenagers, but to all of us as we re-examine the way that God has tried to mold us into the morally excellent people of his kingdom. So this first thought on moral excellence is moral excellence begins with, with accepting God's direction. Turn with me to the Old Testament again, to the book of Hosea. Hosea is one of the minor prophets in our Old Testament. And if you turn to Isaiah or Hosea, excuse me, chapter four, I want to pick out a few phrases from this chapter. Now, if you're not familiar with Hosea, in short, God asks the prophet Hosea, and we're going to put it bluntly here. He asked him to go down to the bad part of town. And from that pool of possible mates in the bad part of town, find himself a wife. You might be thinking, 
Well, um, that's not the first place I would look, but that's what God tells him to do. Go to the bad part of town, find yourself a wife. She's going to be in the harlotry, marry her. He marries a woman named Gomer and together they have a family. They have children together. But in the course of things, Gomer looks back on her life of harlotry and remembers all the fancy things that she had. You know, people treated her very special. When she was a harlot, she got gifts and she had nice things and nice clothes and jewelry and and she put a little smell them on every night. And, you know, life was very luxurious and very comfortable for Gomer when she was still a harlot. And so she leaves her husband, Hosea, the humble, presumably not very well off prophet of God. And I think you understand it. You don't condone it, certainly, but you understand it. If you're used to a very luxurious lifestyle and then you go and marry a poor prophet of God. You know, we talked about the Amish last night in our lesson. Remember, I don't I don't know if Gomer's life was a whole lot more glamorous than the Amish lifestyle. And she's gone, man, before I was a harlot, I had all kinds of nice things. I had silk and smell them. So she goes back to that life of harlotry and God tells her, God tells Hosea later on in chapter 3 to go again and love your wife. He says, love a woman who is loved by her husband and yet is an adulteress. Just as, what's the connection that he makes? What's this whole thing about? The whole marriage to Gomer was a great big parable. It was an object lesson about God's love for his people. And now it's true of Israel, and that's within the context he's talking about Israel. So let's be clear about what the context is. And yet I have a hard time not seeing a practical application there as well. That in a way, has not God called all of us out of a life of sin and harlotry? That God has pulled all of us from the mire and the filth that we once were, and he's welcomed us into his family. Ephesians chapter 5 describes the church as the bride of Christ. And so God has pulled us out of sin and welcomed us into a divine relationship. But like Gomer, we so often fail and fall back into that lifestyle. And God says to Hosea, go again, again, again being the operative word there. Go again and love your wife. Even though she's an adulteress, go again and love her. So we get to chapter four, and this is really where I want to focus on, because in chapter four, this is where God brings the application to Israel, right? He's got the story of Hosea and Gomer and their kids and everything associated with that. Now Hosea four is, okay, Israel, here's the application. Here's the lesson for you. I want you to follow along with me as you go through this chapter, and I won't read the whole chapter just for the sake of time, but there are a number of phrases that I have highlighted in this chapter that illustrate the point that's on the screen here, that moral excellence must begin with accepting divine direction. You have to accept God's commandments, that God's will, you have to accept his testimony, you have to accept that God is your Lord in order to find moral excellence. Notice here that the people of Israel, they were bereft of knowledge of God, it says in verse one, because there's no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. And so the land mourns because there's no knowledge of God. Verse six, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge. I'll reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Verse seven, they sinned against me. They sinned against me. When you sin, you don't just sin against your neighbor. You don't just sin against your children. You don't just sin against your spouse. You sin against God and God takes it personally when you sin because you have sinned against me. Verse eight says, they direct their desire toward their iniquity. And at the end of verse 10, because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. They stopped giving heed to the Lord. Oh, the 10 commandments say this, 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 and this. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I ain't never gonna remember all 10 of those commandments. They stopped giving heed to the Lord. God didn't have control of their lives anymore, at least from their own perspective. Understand that. 
But they didn't see God as, hey, God's not in control of me. God doesn't decide for me. God doesn't make me do anything. They don't give heed to God anymore. And so they go astray and play the harlot in verse 12, departing from their God. They have departed from their God. I know it's hard to let go. And so many sins that we commit are simply a desperate attempt to hold on to control in our lives. We feel like we're losing grip of our finances, so we kind of find the, that little compromise, that little lie, uh, cook the books a little bit. Maybe I can, maybe you can go down to the casino, I go over to Louisiana, and maybe I can make it up at the tables or something, right? It's a desperate attempt to hold on to the money. A lot of abuse that happens in marriages is a desperate, flailing attempt to retain control in that relationship, be it physical abuse, verbal abuse, or psychological abuse as well. It is a desperate, flailing attempt to retain control. You know what's really, really hard? is to stop trying to control everything in your life and do as Jesus says. Why don't you try putting your trust in God? Why don't you stop trying to control the people around you and trust God to be the avenger, to be the judge, and to be the one who is going to ultimately make the decisions in the end? That is very, very hard. And you will never find moral excellence unless you're first willing to let go and let God command you. So the second point on moral excellence is you have to set the right expectations. We tend to live up or down to the expectations that we set for ourselves. And those who take a casual approach to mora uh, morality don't typically feel challenged or pushed or motivated. I mean, think about almost any, almost any endeavor in life is pretty much going to fall within a range of expectations that you set for yourself. Um, if you go into any kind of endeavor, kids, teenagers, young people, I'm going to talk to you for a second here. If you go into any kind of endeavor believing, well, I'm just never going to be able to get this you'll probably never get it. You know, you want to pick up a, an instrument. You're in middle school and you're going to go into band and pick up an instrument, but you play it the first time and you're honking and squeaking and you say, oh, I'm never going to figure this out. You're probably never going to figure this out. You're never going to figure it out. As adults, right, we take a look at our budgets and we're trying to get our budgets under control and maybe someone gave you a Dave Ramsey book or something like that and you're going, I'm going to start putting my pennies into an envelope. But then you start doing it and you go, ah, this is too hard. I'll never get this. I'll never figure this out. In almost any endeavor in life, your results will fall within the expectations that you set. Parents. When you look at your preteen or teenage or college student aged kids, what's your assumption? Well, teenagers are always going to rebel. It happens all the time. Every teenager goes through a phase where they rebel. I mean, if you set the expectation at teenagers always rebel, I'm, I guess we just got to be okay with that for a phase. What do you think your kids are going to do? They're going to rebel. Well, listen, I just, I mean... They're going to go to their friend's house on Saturday night. Their parents are probably going to provide alcohol anyway. Why don't we have the party at our house and we can, at least we can control the alcohol if it's at our house. Because kids, they're going to drink eventually anyway. You might as well just try to set, you know, set some boundaries on it. Everybody's going to look at porn at some point in their life. I'm um, so at the very least what we can do is at least kind of control the flow of the porn. And, 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 you know, we just don't want it to be a really bad habit. Just, you know, we don't do it all the time. Just kind of keep it quiet, keep it under wraps. If you set an expectation in moral matters as the bar is down here, you will never reach right here. Now, maybe you set the bar right here and, and maybe you strive for it and don't quite reach that. But if you set the bar right here... This is as high as you'll ever get if that's the bar that you set when it comes to moral matters. And to be sure, the bar is set very, very high for Christians. 
It is amazing how God provides us with a description and definition of moral excellence almost from cover to cover in the Bible. And yet even with a working, practical, useful, divinely written definition of moral excellence, we sit here and, and rationalize pornography and we rationalize abuse and we rationalize drinking and we rationalize it for our kids, even though... God already gave us the definition of moral excellence. I mean, consider a few things here. In Colossians chapter 3, for example, in the New Testament, Colossians 3 and verse 5, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. That's the bar that God sets. Not kind of dead to immorality, not dabbling in immorality, not a little bit, as long as you do it at home and it doesn't impact Monday, no, you're dead to immorality. You're dead to immorality. He goes on to say, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry, for it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also walked when you were living in them. And the expectation that, of course, he goes on to explain is, but you put them all aside. You got rid of them. You did away with them. Wholesale, totally, absolutely. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the kind of language that we use, that we're not to have coarse language, that we're not to tell filthy and nasty jokes, that there's a kind of sin out there, which is really all sin, that should not even be named among us. I mean, think about that. The bar has been set as live in such a way so that sin is not even named among you. That's the bar being set. Romans chapter 12, the bar is set at total transformation. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you can show what the will of God is. That's the bar that's being set. Sadly, low expectations tend to get transferred to the people around us, especially for those in positions of power. Now, I mentioned Hosea chapter 4 already in verses 6 through 10. He directs his message specifically at the priests, the leaders there in Israel, because you have failed as priests, the people are going to follow. When the priests fail, the people follow as well. And like I said, we see this kind of language and this kind of compromise in parenting, in managing a business, in our language, in our marriages, and sometimes even in the way that the church gets shepherded by its leaders. A third lesson that we learn about moral excellence. Moral excellence is always going to feel out of place in a lost and sin-saturated world. Excellence in any pursuit is exceptional by definition. I mean, that's what the word excellence means. I was an English major in college, so trust me, I know what words mean. But isn't that what excellence is? Like, I'll tell you what. Nobody has ever been on a road trip and gone into a gas station convenience store and bought a candy bar from a gas station convenience store, opened it up, and it's like 11 30 at night and, and, and no one has eaten like a Snickers bar from a gas station and gone like, oh, my life has been changed. This is excellent. I mean, it's a Snickers bar from a gas station, man. Excellent things are excellent by definition. They're not normal. They're not boring. They're not mundane. They're excellent and so when God calls us to moral excellence, like don't let that fact escape you. To be morally excellent is to be exceptional by definition. Unfortunately, it is our natural tendency to kind of fake our way through life. We rest on our laurels. We like to be graded on a curve. Every kid loves it. When teacher says, we're going to go ahead and grade the final on a curve, like, oh, yes, <laughs> graded on a curve. So when we lament that Christian values seem so out of place in this world, I suppose my answer is, what were you expecting? I mean, in conversations with a lot of Christians, what I tend to hear from people is, this world's just falling apart all around us. This country's just 
swirling the bowl of the moral toilet bowl. We say it's everything just falling apart. Schools are falling apart. Government's falling apart. TV's falling apart. It's just everywhere we look. I'm like, I, I, I don't want to be rude or anything. I don't want to like literally shake anybody. But when people say things, I'm like, what were you expecting? I mean, when you find out that this world is a horrible, sick place full of horrible, sick people, like, it's been that way since Genesis chapter 3. It's always been that way. Now, maybe there are times where it ebbs and flows or waxes and wanes, and maybe there are times that we can cover up the moral degeneracy in a thick layer of patriotism or whatever you want to call it. But the fact is that when Jesus uses terminology of his people as the salt of the earth and the light of the world, he means for us to be distinctive. Like he means that. You're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world and you're a city set on a hill. And the reason why you're those things is because your character and your quality is supposed to be so out of this place that when people meet you like salt, they go, oh, wow, that's different. When people meet you for the first time, they can tell this guy's a light. This guy's different. She's like a city set on a hill that can't even be hidden and everybody knows where it is. Salt is only useful if it is distinctively salty. Jesus makes that point. If salt becomes tasteless, what's its purpose anymore? Just to be thrown out into the street. It serves no purpose. And so this is why we keep our behavior excellent. We don't keep our behavior excellent because we want to make people think we're better than them. We don't, we don't want to walk around with our noses turned up in the air and be Mr. Charlie Church everywhere we go and, you know, step all over everyone that we meet and make everyone feel uncomfortable around us because we're superior to them. But we are supposed to keep our behavior excellent because it makes a difference. Because if our behavior is excellent in a fallen and broken world, it actually stands out in a very productive and useful way. That's the point that Peter makes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, when he instructs his readers to keep their behavior excellent among the Gentiles. It's, it's for the purpose of that they might glorify God so that as they interact with you, even if they don't like you, even if they don't understand you, you'll stand out in such a way that maybe your example will convict them, change them. Your example will be a testimony of what God can do through His people. And maybe, just maybe, they'll glorify God because of your example. Uh, we're supposed to produce good fruit because we're good trees. Luke chapter 6 brings that point out as well. And so if you feel a little bit out of place, that's okay. It's okay. And maybe we need to do a better job of talking to our kids about that. Maybe we need to, instead of always pressuring our kids about fitting in and looking the part and, hey, make any new friends today or whatever, maybe we need to just help to train up our children to be prepared for that moment when they realize just how different they are and that they want to be different, and that being different is actually a good thing. Again, in 1 Peter, I know I've gone to 1 Peter quite a bit here in this lesson, but in 1 Peter chapter 4, the apostle offers some encouragement to those facing trouble and alienation and trial. He makes a statement in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But by no means... Let any of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed. But in that name, let him glorify God. Being alienated and isolated and persecuted, that's a good thing. And in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, Jesus even goes out of his way to point that out. For blessed are you when men cast insults at you. Blessed are you when they persecute you for my name's sake, because they also persecuted great men and women of old who came before you. 
Another lesson about moral excellence is, and it's actually kind of dovetails quite nicely into what we were saying, is moral excellence is totally neutralized by moral superiority. Take a look at a couple things here. Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this parable. It's, it's a memorable one. In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, Jesus also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. There were two men who went up into the temple to pray, one of them a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was thus praying to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers and unjust and adulterers or even like Wait a minute. Even like that tax, that tax that tax collector right there. God, I tithe, I give, I fast twice a week. God, you're really lucky to have me on your team. Just, I'm just saying. But, and I don't know if the camera can catch me still. How far can I walk, Chris? before I'm gone. Further? I'll go further. Further. But there was a tax gatherer standing some distance away. He was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. But he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And so of these two people, which one went back to his home justified in the eyes of God? Now, here's the thing about the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you just made like a bullet point list of their sins, the obvious sins, this is, I'm, I'll get to the, the less obvious things in just a sec, but bear with me in a little silliness here. If you just took the obvious sins, whose list would have been longer? The tax collector, like definitely. Because the Pharisee, the Pharisee can stand there and say, like, hey, I do everything right check all the boxes. Uh, I follow the law, keep the Ten Commandments, keep the Sabbath day. I'm circumcised, keep all the food laws. I'm doing everything right, God. They, like there's not, nothing against me. I, I'm an all-star. I'm the A-team. I'm the varsity. I'm exactly who you want on your team. Now you could look at the tax collector and go, let's see, he's probably, he's a liar. He defrauds. He's greedy. He's covetous. He's, he's a conniver and a schemer. And he works with the, the hated Romans. He's probably got this long list of sins that just, in just kind of the obvious ways, whose list was probably longer? The tax collector's list was probably longer. But who went to his home justified? Moral superiority totally neutralizes moral excellence. And all that good that the Pharisee thought he probably thought that he was doing was for naught. It was pointless. Kind of like how Jesus points out back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. When the Pharisees pray long prayers, beautiful prayers, amazing prayers... God doesn't hear those prayers. When the Pharisees grandstand about the charity that they do, that's no credit to them. When the Pharisees fast and they mess up their hair and go, it's a real sacrifice. Oh, but I do it for God. God doesn't see that. At least not in the way that they think God sees it. And all the good that you think you're doing is totally neutralized. It's null and void because of moral superiority when you think you are better than anybody else. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, the apostle adds this statement. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself, than he ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a member, uh, a measure of faith. One more lesson about moral excellence, though. 
you got to be mindful of the shadows. Moral excellence is never found in the shadows. It's never found in the dark places. It's never found with the bad influences. It's never found in the shadows. Let me give you some examples here. I know it's a long bullet point list here, but we'll talk about a few of these things and get to this last point in just a sec. Adam and Eve were not mindful of the shadows. The shadows were the lies that they were being told, the promises that were being made, the the misrepresentation of God's commandments to them. That's what I mean by the shadows. And so when Satan offered something to Eve, instead of being mindful of the shadows, or maybe just asking herself, why in the world is there a snake talking to me right now? She was not mindful of the shadows, and she looked at the fruit. I mean, that's what Genesis 3 clearly says. When she looked at the fruit and saw, oh, it looks good, smells good, I wonder if it tastes good. She was not being mindful of the shadows. Cain was not mindful of the shadows when God confronted him in the next chapter of Genesis When Cain was angry because his sacrifice was not accepted the way that his brother's sacrifice was accepted, and he's he's sulking around, angry at God, stupid sheep, vegetables, vegetables for dinner the rest of his life. He's grumbling and complaining, and God comes in and says, Cain, you need to rein this in. Because sin is crouching at the door right now. And you need to be master over that sin. Cain was not mindful of the shadows, even though God warned him that sin was was right there. Lot wasn't mindful of the shadows when he lived in the land of Sodom all those years, probably patting himself on the back, thinking, I'm doing a really good job here. You know, I'm a a preacher of righteousness in a lost city, and and, you know, I, I think I just need a few more years. Give me a few more years, and I think I can turn Sodom around. And in the end, when it was time to go, and Lot was trying to convince people to go with him, not even his own sons-in-law would go with him. That shows how much influence he really had in Sodom. All those years of being a preacher, all those years of trying to influence, and he was very naive about it. And when the angel said, you need to leave now, he said, no, 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 we can still turn Sodom around. I, I think we could do it. He was not mindful of the shadows. Samson was not mindful of the shadows when multiple times his nasty girlfriend kept asking what his weaknesses were, and he kind of chuckled about it and go, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll tell you what my weaknesses are. And every time, you know, here's a kid's life advice. Life advice time, okay? If you got yourself a girlfriend and every time you guys have a real intimate conversation with each other and a bunch of Philistines jump out from behind the couch, it's probably, it's probably time to break up with her, okay? But Samson was not mindful of the shadows. There was this danger that surrounded him. He welcomed Delilah into his life. He welcomed Delilah into an intimate place in his life, and he was not mindful of the danger that she represented. And every time that danger popped out in the form of Philistines trying to grab him, he just shrugged it off and laughed about it. (laughs) Ah, Delilah, you and your Philistine buddies. He was not mindful of the shadows. David was not mindful of the shadows on one incidental evening. Couldn't sleep that night, so he thought he'd get some fresh air up on the roof of his house. Maybe a cool breeze and a nice view would help with his restlessness. And there was a woman bathing in a home down below his palace. And instead of turning away from the beautiful naked woman bathing... He allowed his eyes to linger. And instead of being satisfied there and moving on, he inquired, so who's that? who lives a block down the street? And his curiosity bred action that eventually resulted in the lost lives of multiple, multiple Israelite faithfuls. 
Well, we typically think of her husband, Uriah, as being this victim, but the text actually says that in this, this schemed battle where Uriah gets killed, it was actually more people than just Uriah got killed in that battle. He was not mindful of the shadows. Peter was not mindful of the shadows when Jesus warned him in advance that Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. What was Peter's response? He'll never get me. I would die for you. I would die for you. And I imagine Jesus, with all the love in his heart for that impetuous mouth stuck, in, uh, foot stuck in his mouth apostle of his, he said, when you fall, you'll come back and you'll lead your brothers and you'll be okay in the long run. But you're going to have a rough night here. Peter was not mindful of the way that his boasting actually betrayed an incredible vulnerability in his life. The very thing he said he would never do. I would never abandon you, Jesus. I would die for you. The very thing that he said he would never do was gifting that to Satan on a silver platter because he wasn't mindful of the shadows. We are also capable of falling into the shadows. Jesus reminds us that on a fundamental level, sin is sin, functionally. Anger and murder, lust and adultery, they're not any different. Now, they're different in the form that they come in, but functionally, the materials that they're made out of? In his Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if you're going to be angry with your brother, you're already guilty as if you're a murderer. If you're going to lust after a woman, you're already guilty as if you were an adulterer. Because it starts here in the heart. Now again, anger is not actually murder and lust is not actually adultery. But they're made of the same stuff. They're made of the same ingredients. And it's very easy for me to compare myself favorably to others without realizing that I'm the one in danger. Well, I, I mean, I know I've got a temper problem, but I never murder anybody. Well, that's what that guy who murdered said 10 years ago. I know I've got a lust problem. I've got wandering eyes. I would never cheat on my wife, though, which is exactly what the adulterer said 10 years ago. On the path to moral excellence, I need to recognize and anticipate the shadowy areas of my life, my work relationships, the flirtatious nature of my interaction with coworkers, the way that my actions, the way I touch, speak to, and interact with other people can be interpreted or misinterpreted. The way I raise my children, the way I control my temper, the kinds of jokes that I tell, the kind of TV shows that I watch, the kind of movies I watch, the music that's blaring in my car when I'm sitting at a stoplight. Now, I might be able to say, well, I'm not a murderer. You can't get mad at me, Ryan. I'm still pretty morally excellent. That is an oxymoron. There's no such thing as pretty excellent. Because excellence is exceptional by definition. And so I call each and every one of us tonight, especially our young people, in this incredible battle that you're fighting right now for your soul, let us strive for moral excellence so that, bring it around full circle, just as David points out in Psalm 51, when I can be clean and pure and excellent and reshaped and remade in God's image, I can go teach sinners about you and I can praise you, God, in the great assembly and I can live with joy for the rest of my days and all the way into eternity. And I want that for you as well. So if you have any spiritual need at all this evening, please let that need be known by coming forward as we